So welcome to the second Raspberry Pi class. Tonight what we're going to do is walk through a little application that I wrote for the Raspberry Pi and that you can play with. Kind of gives you a feel for the kind of things you might want to program on top of a Raspberry Pi. It uses Python, um, but the code's not that complex, so it's pretty straightforward. And we're going to take a look at using that both by itself and then also interfacing that program with the Pi Face digital boards that we have. So, hopefully everyone's connected right now. We are going to need internet access tonight for a couple of things. So, make sure you have internet access either via the wireless or via one of the wired connections. If you're using the wireless, you're going to need to boot into the desktop and actually connect. If you're using the wired connection, it should just be automatic. As soon as you plug it in, a few seconds later, it should be good to go. Any questions on any of that before we get started? Okay. So, we're going to go through a lot of concepts tonight, not all of which we have a ton of time to dwell on. The pro project we're doing tonight kind of grabs a lot of components from different places, so don't worry if you don't understand everything. We can always go over it more later. Um, hopefully you'll get enough of the gist to understand the core of what's going on, even if the details aren't all there. So... Tonight we're going to be building what I'm calling the Twitter alarm clock. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's a program that searches Twitter for some query, counts the number of tweets that match that query, so a specific hashtag or something. Um, so you can search for the hashtag, I hate Twitter, see how many tweets match that. Then you give it some threshold. If the number of tweets that match your search is over the threshold, then the program calls some action. So that can be playing a sound, it can be turning things on and off with the digital board, uh, it can really be anything you want. So this is a pretty common type of application for the Raspberry Pi. On one side, our applications can kind of reach out to the internet and interface with Twitter to take in some information from the outside world. And then on the other side, it's going to perform some action for us. Um, so it's going to basically react to things happening on the internet in order to cause some action to happen for us. Um, you can do anything with the Raspberry Pi, it's just a Linux computer, but this kind of touch the internet on one side, touch my local environment on the other type program is a pretty common application that suits itself well to the Pi. So tonight we're going to be monitoring Twitter for things to happen, and in response we're going to be acting on them. Um, it's a fun example, but it's super trivial, right? There's nothing special about it. The point's just to kind of teach some of the different things you can do. The first part of the example isn't even specific to the Raspberry Pi. You could run this program on any machine that has internet access and runs Python 3. Um, the second part does get Raspberry Pi specific because we're going to start to use some special calls to this device, and obviously this doesn't connect to your regular computer. Uh, but the first part, not specific to the Raspberry Pi, just happens to be the fun kind of thing you might want to do on a Raspberry Pi. Questions on any of that before we get started? Okay, so hopefully most of you are using a copy of the image I sent out earlier, either because you have one of the SD cards I just handed you or because you downloaded it yourself. If you're not using that, there's some software we're going to use tonight that you might have to install. Uh, your commands might not work the same way as my commands. It's not the end of the world, we can get through it, but if you want to use one of my SD cards, your life will be easier. So, without further ado, uh, so I'm connected to my Raspberry Pi via SSH, you guys are connected directly, that doesn't make any difference. Uh, I'm going to start by kind of just showing what this program does for, uh, actually we'll start by downloading the source code for this program. So if you just do an ls in your home folder, some of you might have a folder called Twitter Alarm Clock already. If you do, you need to remove it. The last class was right before you, so these SD cards have been touched once. Um, so I don't, but you know, if I had a <coughs> so if you have a folder like this called Twitter Alarm Clock, which many of you probably do, so don't ignore this step, uh, you need to run the following command to delete it. So yes is just a command on Linux that prints out a series of Ys. The delete command is going to ask us for confirmation. So this basically just says yes to every confirmation instead of making us hit Y 30 some odd times. Not necessary, just makes your life easier. Um, we're going to pipe the output of that command to the standard delete command. So rm is delete, dash r means recursive. So this means go into a folder and delete everything inside. Be careful. There's no, I mean, this is Linux. We're not holding your hand anymore. There's no recycle bin. And this is a one-stop shop. So, if you accidentally put a star right now, don't put a star right now. I've said that and had people like click happy, do it. Um, you will delete everything in your home folder and all of your data would be gone. So 
Be careful when using this command, especially when you're auto-confirming everything, right? It's not even going to give you a second chance. Uh, just type in the name of the folder you want to remove, make sure, and then hit enter, and your folder will be gone. So if you have this folder, run this command. If we don't want it there, it'll interfere with other things. Someone's already screwed it up. Wait, uh, I just want to point out, is there a reason you don't use IM-R-F to just force remove everything that would work as well. Yes well, because normally I don't want the dash F because I want the warnings, right? Like, because normally you don't get warnings. The only reason we're getting warnings is because we're using Git, and Git has a bunch of protected oh, files. Okay. So I don't normally use the F because I want to know about the warnings. I just happen to know that in this case there's a bunch of warnings, and my default reaction is just to throw yes F. Oh. But yes, there's multiple ways of doing this. Okay. Do you need to borrow a Raspberry Pi, Dave? Just go ahead and get it connected and connect to the internet. You probably just want to use Ethernet because it's going to make your life easier than the wireless. But go ahead and plug in and get it booted and make sure you can connect. Um, okay, any other questions? So if you've deleted that, your home folder now should look more or less like this. Only you're not going to have this WAV file here, but you should have pretty much everything else if you're using my SD image. Uh, so we're using a... All of the code for tonight, we're going to go ahead and download right now. I've already written it for you. You guys can modify it and hack on it a little bit tonight, especially afterwards. But for the sake of your edification, I've already written a lot of the code for us this evening. Uh, the code is stored on a service called GitHub. Git is a version control system. It's basically a program that keeps track of changes while you're programming. Uh, when you get into writing big programs, or really when you get to writing any programs, using some kind of version control is a good idea. It's a system that like saves your work at every milestone, so if you make a mistake, you can roll back to it. Git's a version control system. GitHub is a cloud-based service that basically will store all of the files for me in Git. It's kind of like Dropbox, but for code. So my code's already up there. You can access it at this web address. There's a link to here from the RPI website for tonight. Uh, so however you want to do it, get to this web page. You're going to have two options. If you have your own GitHub account, what you want to do is fork my project. So load this project page, log into GitHub, load my project page, and kick fork. If you don't have a GitHub account, don't worry about that. We'll just do read. You'll just use read-only access. Uh, it'll matter here in the next step. But if you do have a GitHub account and you fork it, it'll actually let you save your changes. If you don't have a GitHub account, you're not going to be able to save your changes. It doesn't really matter, but there are two ways of doing this. So once you go ahead and pull this up, if you're going to fork it, fork it and go to your copy. If you're not going to fork it, come here to my copy. And what you want to click on is, if you're on my copy, you want to click Git Read Only. If you're on your copy, you can use either one of these, whatever you prefer. You probably want HTTP. So what you want to do is copy whatever address is here. Um, so I can say with a control C. Open up a terminal. You're either working on one directly, or if you're using the desktop environment, go ahead and open one up. And we need to run a command called git clone. So this basically is going to copy all the code from GitHub locally. Um, again, uh, you can paste by doing control shift V. When you're in the terminal, you can't just do control V. You have to do control shift and then the hotkey. So if you don't have a GitHub account, you're going to be running this command, git clone git github.com slash ace slash twitter alarm clock. If you do have a GitHub account, what you want to run is your fork, and you probably want to use HTTPS. So you just switch that to HTTPS, and then instead of my username, you would put your GitHub username. So two ways of doing this. If you have a Twitter, or if you have a GitHub account, your username and HTTPS. If you don't have a GitHub account, keep all of this the same, but put git here instead of HTTPS. So just G-I-T colon slash slash. Questions <coughs> on this? So if you've done everything correctly and your internet's working, if you hit enter, it should say cloning, and a minute later, it'll spin us back out. And if we run an ls now, we should have a fresh copy of this Twitter alarm clock folder, inside of which is all the code we're going to be working on. Interrupt me if I've lost people. Are we good? If you're not using my version of the SD card, uh, git's not installed by default. You just need to do sudo apt git install git. But the version of the SD card I handed out tonight, I already took care of that for you. Everyone good? Do you know if that works on Mac? Uh, the apt git install? No. Because 
Apple has no package manager. There are third-party package managers. The most popular is a system called Homebrew. So if you Google Homebrew, you can install a system like that. The command's not apt to get. It's like Homebrew, but it's a similar kind of thing. It gives you something you can type and then the name of what you want to install. Nothing's as good as the Linux package managers, but Homebrew tries to bake it on the back. So. Vim has no syntax highlighting for Python. Vim doesn't? Yeah, it doesn't. I just opened up your Twitter and I'm not buying it. Why are you Python. using Vim? Because that's all I do. <laughs> I just installed, I just did sudo apt-get install Vim. Does it not have There's no syntax highlighting at all installed. It should, by default, install it for like all the common languages. I have no idea. I don't use them, so I did not test that. Yeah. Um, if you can fix it, let me know what I need to install, and we can have people okay. install it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and demo this real quick for you guys. Uh, if we go into this folder, you'll see we have a readme and we have our code. There's actually one thing missing from this folder that I didn't put on Git. Uh, in order for this to work, by default, the default action is for it to play an audio file. So I need to provide it with an audio file, and by default it looks for a file in this folder called alarm.wave, all lowercase. So I'm just going to copy it. Don't worry about doing this right now, we can deal with this later, but because I need to demo it, I'm going to copy in a file. So now I have my alarm.wave. So if you have these three things, this program is ready to run and you have internet access. So the way this program works, if we run it like this, it's going to just spit out an error. It says that I have too few arguments. It requires two arguments, a search query and a count. So this can be anything. You can have hashtags here. You can have add symbols that speaks most of the Twitter syntax, if you're familiar with that. You can also just have straight up words. Um, so we're going to go ahead and search, um, play some funky music, the hashtag. Um, one note, if you're searching hashtags, the hash symbol is actually a comment on the command line. So we need to escape this. You can either put it in quotes or if you just put a forward slash. But if you run it like that, it acts as a comment and it actually doesn't. It's going to throw that error again because it just thinks this is all a big comment. Uh, so that's just specific to using the hashtag here. If you don't want to use a hashtag, you're not going to have this issue. But if you need a hashtag, you need to escape it first. So we're going to search Twitter for the hashtag play some funky music. Um, I wonder if anyone has that, anyone's using that hashtag. But then we need to give it a threshold. So it's going to make this search. It's going to count the number of tweets that match the search. And if they exceed the threshold, it's going to perform the action. So we'll just give it nine. We'll say we need at least nine tweets. I don't entirely know whether or not this hashtag is in use. So we will find out. Okay, so if I run this command, and if we give it a second, it's either going to do something or it's going to start to give us some output. Cool. So it's telling us that currently there are zero tweets that match this. It's not going to do anything. Um, but it is going to keep rerunning this search every 10 seconds. So it's just going to sit here now and wait for the number of tweets we have to exceed the value we specified, and then it's going to do something. So now we need to go to Twitter, and we need to start using this hashtag. So if you have a Twitter account, feel free to join in the fun. Uh, so if we paste and say testing. Okay, is anyone else tweeting or is this all of me? Do I need to do nine? <laughs> I take that as a yes. I don't, yeah. use I don't use Twitter either. I just signed up for an account because I needed to demo this. No, you have to. Twitter, what do you use? Nothing. I Emacs, I don't use Twitter. You know, Emacs has a plugin for Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I know, uh, I figured out how to do syntax highlighting on if okay. anyone's using VA. So did you have to install something? No, it's uh, by default it's turned off on for whatever reason. Okay. Honest, but it's colon syntax on. So if anyone else is a masochist and is using them, John will know how to turn your stuff on for you. Okay, so if we watch this, the number of tweets are slowly counting up, right? We're up to four, so clearly I need to tweet more. Um, it lags by a few seconds just by nature of, you know, Twitter not being instantaneous. I got an uh, error message, alarm.web, no 
file or do that be found? Right, so you need to put in an alarm.wav file. That's what I just did. Oh, you we'll get to that in a second. It doesn't come, I, I didn't put a wave file in the Git repo, so oh, you'll okay. need to find your wave file. I have some you can download, but we'll get to it here in a second. All right. So let me keep tweeting. I shouldn't have put nine. It's way too big of a number. And Twitter does not like you tweeting in rapid succession. Oops, I already tweeted that. <coughs> I put up a couple. Good, it worked. <laughs> okay, so when it hit nine tweets, it started playing the song, and then when the song's over, it'll exit. And I'm gonna have to close this song before 30 seconds, or else I can't put this on YouTube later because it won't be fair use. <laughs> so, that's what we're going for. Um, that's what the program does at the end. You can obviously put whatever you want for alarm, right? You could run this in the background. So I'm running it headless right now. I'm not even connected to a monitor. So I could go plug this in at home, hook it up to my stereo, and have it searching for help the zombie apocalypse, right, to automatically sound an alarm when Twitter realizes the zombie apocalypse is happening. Um, because Twitter is actually pretty good at ascertaining what's going on in the real world, assuming you can pick the right hashtag or something for what people are going to use, you can actually use this to have your computer react to real world events and stuff before they occur, right? It can just sit there waiting for them to occur, and when they occur based upon some threshold of tweets, you can trigger some action to go with it. So questions on what it does, and we can dive into how it does it. All right? Okay. <coughs> 